One an extra programme. In light of yesterday's tense climax to the Premiership Championship, Charles Lambert looks at Blackburn Rovers' historic triumph as they take the Championship title for the first time in 81 years. Jackpot! I think Jack Walker is every fan's dream. Every fan standing on the terraces dreams that one day they'll win the lottery, they'll win the pool, they'll win something, and they can spend all their money on what they love, which is their club, and sit in the chairman's box. Players want to go to Blackburn, not because it's Blackburn Rovers, and not because it's Jack Walker waving money under their noses. They want to go because it's Kenny Dalglish. They genuinely want to work with Kenny Dalglish. And time and time again, you know the players are going there because of Dalglish. And it's that loyalty which he commands, which I think has been one of the major aspects of making him so successful. Once in a while, sport produces partnerships which transcend the normal limits of good fortune. It's a classic example of the sum of the parts being greater than the whole. Williams and Mansell in Formula One, Torville and Dean in Ice Dance, McCain and Rum in The National. Individually, they demonstrate appreciable qualities. But the fusion of skills, the merger of talents, takes the partnership to a higher plane and makes the combination, for a time at least, unbeatable. The pairing of Jack Walker and Kenny Dalglish has taken football by storm. They've succeeded where others have failed time and time again. In less than 200 league games, Rovers have gone from bottom of Division 2 to Premier Champions. It's been the biggest single investment ever seen in our national game. £50 million has been spent here in under four years. Blackburn, Britain's most successful national lottery town, has reaped the rewards. It's gained a new stadium and won back its pride. In a season of 42 games, who would have predicted that the outcome of the championship would still hang in the balance in the dying seconds of the final matches? United had whittled away the Rovers' cushion of eight points, and at Upton Park they knew only a win would take the title back to Old Trafford. At Anfield, Rovers were in confident mood, ecstatic when Alan Shearer scored his 37th goal of the season. Right into the path of Ripley. Jeff Kenner's made a run on this side. Shearer! Yes! Back at Upton Park, West Ham went ahead, and Rovers seemed to have it in the bag. And it's in by Hughes! And then things started to fall apart. Equalisers, first from United, And then Liverpool. And outside him is Kennedy. Oh, it's there, the equaliser! It's John Barnes! And then this happened. It's a free kick to Liverpool. Just in case you wanted some more drama. Redknapp lines the ball up. And Redknapp shoots! It's in! It's in! It's a goal by Jamie Redknapp! Liverpool lead 2-1! They just can't take it in, Blackburn! All round the ground, there's cheering anyway! Redknapp has scored to make... and Blackburn is suddenly celebrating! They must have heard something else from West Ham! I don't believe any of this, it's just too much like a fairy story. They're 2-1 down and they're embracing. What can you say about this? And the whistle's gone. Well, amazing scenes. Blackburn have lost here. They've lost here, but they are champions.
What was it like this afternoon watching oh, Manchester? Watching Manchester. Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. Oh, Nailed that. Oh, <laughs> do, do you ever think you'd see something like this up Lavin again? No. Medicine, but for Uncle Jack Medicine. Walker, no. He's the reason, isn't he? What, what sort of impact would you say he's had on, on Blackburn? Well, well, it's going to great, really. Oh, it's uh, it's it? a good thing for the town, good thing for everybody. She, no, Sutton. Colin. Colin, Colin. Andrew. Kenny. Boynes. And the goal. We really waited for this and it's ours and I think we're going to good things and we'll always be the ones now to um, be on the top. We'll always like say to Man United, watch over your shoulder because you know we're going to be the best. It's as simple as that. I've never seen anything like it in the town before. It's been rocking, really. It's been, you know, uh, pubs have been drunk dry. Uh, it'll go on for another week, I'm sure it will. We're famous. It's brilliant. You know what I mean? I've supported them all my life. Blackburn people, but we live in Manchester. We take loads of stick from Manchester people. We're walking around. We're getting abuse all season, but we don't care because we're the champions. Jack Walker is a millionaire many times over. One survey ranks him as the 24th richest man in Britain and lives the life of true luxury in the Jersey tax haven of St Helier. His wealth wasn't inherited or won, he earned it. And like most self-made men, he was born with a knack, an intuitive ability to spot an opportunity and prosper from it. Blackburn in 1945 may have seemed a barren place from which to launch an empire. For a town which once boasted 200 mills and was a founding member of the Cotton Club, this was now a community scarred by war. But there were cars, and the early days of urban motoring provided a steady stream of accident-damaged vehicles for the backstreet garage run by Jack Walker and his father. The business was moderately successful, but it would never do much more than pay the rent. We had a sheet metal business, which is employing about four people plus myself and um, we weren't really getting anywhere with a turnover six thousand pounds in a year and opportunities came along to develop the business Her Majesty saw that not all Lancashire's eggs are in the basket of cotton when the Queen visited Blackburn in 1955 to open an electronic components factory, Britain, like the rest of Western Europe, was in the middle of a rapid industrial expansion, and Jack Walker spotted his moment. There was a scarcity of steel to build the modern new plants. With his brother, Fred, he set up a stockholding company, and the formula was devastatingly simple. Buy the steel, hold it till the price goes up, sell it, and charge a commission. Success produced a one million square foot warehouse at Guide, so vast that workers would cycle from one section to another. It was probably the best specialised steels company in Britain, if not Europe. And he got that way by employing very good people, the best that he could find, investing in the best equipment and getting a competitive advantage by being better than other people. But the man who'd spotted the demand for steel in post-war Britain had the foresight to recognise when the market had peaked. In 1989, just before steel production slumped, Jack Walker struck a £330 million deal with British Steel, the biggest private company sale in Britain. Walker had his millions. He may have bought the most expensive farmhouse in St Helier, but his roots were buried deep in Lancashire, and so was his dream to revitalise the club and terraces that were part of his heritage. I would have been about really 
15 when I started getting onto the into the Rovers and uh, my memories of this, of this ground being packed and um, always seemed a lot of excitement. But the good days were long gone and by the 80s Rovers were treading water in Division 2. With average gates down to 7,000, what Blackburn needed more than memories was money. The man who wasn't the owner, wasn't the chairman and wasn't even a director began to put his own funds into the club. Slowly at first, just enough to attract some headline players, like Ozzy Ardiles, the star of Argentina's 1978 World Cup winning team, and Steve Archibald, lured away from Barcelona to make 20 appearances for Rovers. And it was Walker's money behind the failed, and some argued, the embarrassing bid to tempt Gary Lineker away from Spurs for £2 million. Pounds. I've always loved Blackburn, and Blackburn Rovers, and I could see them going very fast into the third division. And to get back from the third division, you know, can take a long time. Money doesn't come into it. Once you're down there, you can't get the players and you can't get the atmosphere. And uh, I, that's really decided I had to do something, and, and that's what I did, did it for. But as Rovers entered their 92nd year in the league, survival was the name of their game. They missed the drop into the obscurity of the third division by just four points, and the new season held little promise of a change in fortune. Walker and his money were failing to buy success, and the decaying ground stood only as a monument to an era when the world was a different place. Once before, riches had chased rewards. In the years before the lights went out across Europe and the generation of footballers never returned from the front, the people of Blackburn had a kindly benefactor to turn to. Lawrence Cotton had the name to match his trade and this wealthy manufacturer was made chairman of Rovers in March 1905. In circumstances that were an uncanny precursor to events a lifetime later, Cotton found that he had control of a club which was close to relegation. His solution too was to throw money at it. It was reputed that he spent £33,000 on the ground and during the same period a figure of between twelve and fourteen thousand pounds on players. He broke the transfer record on a number of occasions. First of all in January 1911 when they signed Jock Simpson from Falkirk for a fee of one thousand eight hundred pounds. That record was broken when the club signed Danny Shea from West Ham United. Shea was signed for two thousand pounds and it was now, on the eve of a great war which would produce heroes by the thousand, that Blackburn found themselves with a man who was to prove the greatest rover of all. Robert Crompton led the team to their first championship win in 1912, and again in 1914. Well, we've been absolutely thrilled that Blackburn Rovers are coming good once again, yeah, because Blackburn was his, was his life. He was always, always the boss, was my grandfather, and the boss of his business. He, He's quite a stern man in many ways, from what my mother used to tell me about uh, the way he used to uh, run his businesses and deal with people, and uh, he was, uh, hadn't any time for people who, uh, who he thought didn't measure up to his standards. Crompton's status in Blackburn became legendary in 1928, as the team which he was now managing took the FA Cup from under the noses of the favourites Huddersfield. London calling. Now we're taking you over to the Wembley Stadium for today's great contest. The captains just greet each other with a hearty handshake. A short dash through. Here's a great chance. Ross Campus bundled Mercer and the ball at the net. It's a goal to Blackburn Rovers and well under a minute. Joe, what a sensational start. The following day, the team returned home and film that's been hidden almost from the day it was shot reveals how the welcome on the road from Preston was low-key. But by the time Rovers arrived in Blackburn, the pavements were overflowing. The victory whipped up local support, and within months Ewood Park was to stage the game which still holds the record home attendance. The cup tie with Bolton packed the ground to the rafters, 62,500 people watched a one-all draw. 
Rovers had to wait another 30 years before getting close to the FA Cup again. Wembley, 1960, and an uninspiring game which saw Blackburn lose 3-0 to Wolves, was blighted even more because of injury. Dave Whelan was carried off with a broken leg and never played a first-team match again.